There are, unfortunately, a lot of bodies on Everest. Uh, my understanding, I think it's about 160 bodies now, of the over 800 climbers who have reached the summit. And many of those bodies are on the mountain. Someone dies on Everest and you get a phone call. You have nothing to relate it to. You don't, you wouldn't believe it. You'd hang on for days thinking you would, someone would emerge from the storm alive. People believe that it's a simple jaunt up Everest. Uh, the movies and the books kind of have glorified it in a sense. And so you feel as though if you have enough money, you're strong, fit, 21 and invincible, you too can climb Everest. The danger of Everest has possessed mountaineers for decades. One in seven climbers who have reached the summit has died on the mountain. Since the mid-1980s, for large fees, commercial expeditions have been offering guided services to take amateur climbers to the top of the world. In 1999, 22-year-old Michael Matthews, a high-flying trader from London, paid $40,000 for his shot at the summit. But the organization of the expedition Michael joined fell apart, and he found himself alone, separated from his team, fighting a vicious storm. Michael Matthews became the 162nd person to die on Everest. To some, he was another inexperienced climber, caught out of his depth in a bad storm. But the other clients in Michael's team tell a different story. They feel the expedition was a shambles and Michael's death might have been avoided. This is the story of how a trader from the city came to be alone and dying in Everest's death zone. gets there in the day, sees which way the market's going. When it does kick off, it happens very, very quickly. You have a split second to make a decision of the caliber of Mike walking through the door and getting it and just having that extra sense to do that little bit extra that you don't know where they get it from. He was probably one of three that have ever been through the door here. Mike had a gift for, for trading. He was making more than the rest of us, uh, trading big positions. It was very difficult to tell whether Michael was up money, how much he was up, whether he was down or how much he was down. But he just clicked with it. It, was, it kind of came naturally to him. Before long, he was the top trader within, within the company. There was no flashness about him in any way. For other people were buying Ferraris, Porsches, things like that. You know, I don't think that even crossed Mike's mind. That's not what he's in it for. Age 22, Michael Matthews seemed to have it all. A job in the city that could earn him hundreds of thousands, a flat in the heart of Fulham, and a fast-paced career that was the envy of many. But one day at work, a magazine article would change Michael's life forever. As far as I can remember, it first happened when I picked up a magazine, something like FHM or uh, GQ and there was an article about various activities that involved a bit of risk but things that were worth really worth going after and one of them was an article on Everest I knew that Mikey had done some climbing as well so we had uh, a little bit of a common interest so I just went down to his desk threw the magazine on his desk and said do you fancy doing that and he just looked down at it and said yeah alright then and honestly, that was that was how it all started. It was just this idea: hey, let's go and let's go and do this. And it sounds quite flippant now. You know, it was just the start of an idea, and you're always going to be fairly optimistic when you start things off, aren't you? The 
company featured in the article were the British-based outfit OTT. They ran commercial expeditions all over the world. At $40,000, Everest was their most expensive. OTT had an excellent track record of getting clients successfully to the summit and had never lost anyone on the mountain. Some of these teams now are making huge amounts of money. We're really selling a, almost an ego thing. I suppose you know, here, here we are offering Everest, um, and the, you know, the profit margins are, are fairly reasonable. You can, one team is charging 30,000, another 40, 50, 64, 100,000, the profit margins are significant. Time and time again, we see people with a whim and money to satisfy that whim. They come here, and teams are prepared to take them, and yet when you really look into it, they've got no experience whatsoever. And, you know, that's dangerous at the end of the day. Unfortunately, a lot of people hope that the mountain is going to turn them around. They're going to take one look at the mountain and decide that their experience clearly is not up to it. I'm not sure that's right. Michael and Jamie arrived in Kathmandu, ready to go for Everest. They'd signed up with OTT and met the criteria for the expedition by summiting Aconcagua in Argentina, the highest peak in the Americas. Everest was to be the start of a great adventure together. On their 1999 Everest expedition, OTT had signed up 13 clients, each paying a minimum of $40,000 for a shot at the summit. Over the first two weeks, the clients trekked through Nepal to Everest Space Camp. For Jamie and Michael, it was freedom from the city. How much you pay? How much looking. you pay? We pay, How much you pay one rupee, Mike. Uh -huh. One rupee. Uh -huh. And that's too much. Yeah. <laughs> Michael was very exuberant, lively, larger than life. He just was such a nice, natural, down-to-earth young kid going on a, on a great adventure. And I think that's what I liked about him. You can see little bits of Everest from about, I think, about seven days out from base camp. And that's when you start to realize this thing is, is really high, really, really high. After two weeks trekking, Michael and Jamie reached base camp on the Kumbu Icefall. As OTT began to set up camp, they had a chance to get to know the other clients. Among them were a Canadian team, Dr. Dennis Brown and cameraman Dave Rodney. Katja Starchas from Holland hoped to be the first Dutch woman to summit. And John Krellin from the Isle of Man was a novice climber, who, like Michael and Jamie, had climbed Aconcagua. To many of the other guides on Everest that year, the mixture of OTT's team could be a problem. I think OTT that year were, were a fairly diverse bunch of, of, of characters, there's no doubt about it. They were all after different things. But that was what, what they were confronted with. They had to by and large, not work together much, but climb together, and that's, that's quite difficult. That produces with such a diverse bunch of people all sorts of other pressures, and, and you could see that bubbling up. From the very beginning, right in Kathmandu, I was very alarmed that we did not have a team meeting. There was no team meal, there was no introduction, this is this person from this place, and here are the other teammates, and tell us a little bit about yourself. At base camp, for the first time we had all of the climbers together and it was very obvious that we had two teams now I had not realized that and I personally thought the whole thing was quite unwieldy I was really concerned about the fact we didn't have team meetings every day because I think there are so many important issues to talk about and then finally also you're thinking I'm not a leader I'm I'm just a participant well if this is the way we are doing the expedition, if this is the way, well, so be it. Although the clients had concerns about the ad hoc nature of the team meetings at the start, 
they soon had a bigger worry to focus on. They faced another 11,000 feet to the summit of Everest. The route they would take passes through four camps. To acclimatize, they had to start climbing the mountain in stages. The first obstacle was the icefall, one of the most dangerous parts of the climb. So, good morning everybody. It's uh, just before 8 o'clock on April the 11th. Here we are at, uh, wow, 18,500 feet. Been climbing since, uh, well, just after 6 o'clock. Onward and upward. Although climbing on ice was new to Michael, he mastered the technique of the icefall well. And over the first couple of weeks, the OTT team made good progress in acclimatizing. Nicely done, Mikey. Good job, Mikey. But unlike the rest of the team, things didn't go to plan for Jamie. On his first climb in the icefall, he was struck down with severe headaches, dizziness and exhaustion. His lack of experience at altitude had hit him. Physically, I was feeling like I was just going to collapse. I was feeling like I was losing control of, of my body and I was thinking, fuck, this is it, I'm on the way out. I have no control over this. Jamie was in a critical condition and diagnosed as having altitude sickness. The only way to recover was to go down the mountain. His Everest attempt was over and Michael would be left alone. Mike was upset that I was going and I was upset to be leaving Mike. We'd done everything together as a team up until that point. Although it was becoming clear that even if I did carry on, we were going to be doing things separately because he was leaps and bounds ahead of me and his ability to acclimatize and to just climb the mountain. My last words to Mike were I just, I told him I loved him and that there were lots of people who loved him that were waiting for him at home. Not to take any unnecessary risks. He said, I know, I won't. Tell everyone at home I love them. I'll see you in six weeks. And that was pretty much the last last few things we said. When Jamie left the Everest expedition, Michael had to put the loss of his best friend behind him. The team had finished acclimatizing and were about to begin a summit push. But unbeknown to the clients, a problem had emerged with the oxygen they would be using higher on the mountain. The team leaders at base camp were just becoming aware that it could jeopardize everyone's expedition. I first realized there was a problem about oxygen in 1999 when the oxygen arrived late at base camp and I was um, co-located with Henry Todd who was supplying oxygen to many teams on the mountain. And there was this sort of strange huddle where Henry and his guide Andy Lapkus would go off into the tent for almost two days. Uh, it, it, clearly there was a, a, there was a problem and we weren't told at the time what that problem was. It later became apparent that when they tested the oxygen bottles, when they tried to fit the regulator to the bottle, it wasn't working. Henry Todd had been supplying teams on Everest with oxygen for many years. The industry standard was Poisk, the Russian bottled oxygen and regulator. But in 1999, Todd had a mixture of bottles on Everest. Some were the smaller Poisk ones but others were bigger American and British bottles. The problem Todd had was the Russian Poisk regulator didn't fit the bigger bottles. To make it work, they had to file down the thread on the connection or insert a small plastic pip. Either way, it was proving difficult to get to work. In their brochure, OTT stated they only use Russian oxygen. That year on Everest, the expedition leader was John Tinker. Now, he was faced with a potentially dangerous problem. Clearly, OTT had a big problem with this. John Tinker particularly was very angry that he, he was getting oxygen that, that wasn't working. 
Throughout OTT's acclimatization climbs, Sherpas had carried the oxygen bottles and stored them at camps three and four, ready for the summit push. When John Tinker found out about the problems, it was too late. The mixture of Russian and adapted bottles were already high on the mountain. Of course there was always the option to call a mountain expedition off, but you, you, you were dealing with people who were desperate to climb that mountain. The chances of them accepting that decision were limited. At base camp, it became clear to us that the oxygen system was undergoing certain alterations. But we didn't know exactly what, because we were assured that everything was going to be fine. Slightly different system, but it would work perfectly. The oxygen equipment I thought we were going to use was, as they'd stated in their, as it were, their, their itinerary. It was the latest POISC system, uh, the reliable oxygen system. Some of the clients felt Tinker hadn't told them the whole story about the oxygen. They wouldn't find out about the adaptations to the bigger American and British bottles until they were higher up the mountain. Unaware of the problems ahead, Michael and the first team of clients eagerly set off through the icefall for their summit bid up through camps one to four. Through the icefall, the team made it to Camp 2, also known as Advanced Base Camp. It was here that guide Nick Kikus introduced them to the basics of how the Russian oxygen system would work. I filmed Nick Kikus explaining the oxygen system at Advanced Base Camp. Graduate from 1 to 7. That's um, Immediately to his left is Michael Matthews. He's describing how a POIX system would work and how things would work with this American system, which is basically the same. That just connects in. Okay, it's just a sort of spade clip. Pushes and it's in position. <coughs> this is your chance to All right. the oxygen. After explaining the Russian system, Kikas went on to tell the clients of the adaptations to the bigger American and British bottles. But some of the clients weren't happy. There were different levels of ease and unease. I was quite uneasy. But this whole bottle issue of trying something twice the size of made from a different system in a different country, I, I didn't like the idea at all. And other people were blissfully naive. I don't know if in advance there was something uh, known about the oxygen problems. It, uh, to my uh, knowledge, it appeared only in Camp 2 that there were problems. So I was surprised when um, they said, oh, we've uh, had a change in oxygen cylinders, uh, but it's going to be to your advantage, it was made out to be, that these cylinders would um, last longer and be just as good. So it's the last day of April. We have exactly one month to finish this off. It's been a rust day, although there's been a fair bit of nerves, which has made it uh, not so restful. Uh, there's quite a big concern regarding the amount of oxygen bottles that we have and uh, regulators and masks and all that sort of stuff, but we're going to leave that up to all the other boys to figure out that's what uh, we're paying them the big bucks for. From Camp 2, Michael and the team made it through Camp 3 and the final steep climb into Camp 4. After spending the night there, weather permitting the following day, they would stand on top of the world. But by the next morning, the situation had drastically changed. Overnight, expedition leader John Tinker had suffered a minor stroke, and team doctor Dennis Brown decided he must go down to safety. In the confusion, Michael and the whole team were ordered down by Tinker and Nick Kikas. Their summit bid was over. The 
the story that I got from John Tinker was that he'd had an episodes of numbness, tingling, a little weakness, mainly affecting his face. I was concerned that he could possibly have suffered a small transient type of stroke. I was alarmed enough to say that I think we should be going down. We were coming down the Lhotse face. At one stage, we stopped at Camp 3. And I said, you know, I don't know where Dave is. This is a bit strange, you know. And we waited and waited, and there was no Dave. So we got on the radio to try and find out where he was, and we found that he'd stayed up at Camp 4. I thought, okay, we've got 35 Sherpas on the team. We have a number of guides on the team. Why is it that an entire team would go down. I thought, while we're here, if we can take a shot, we should take it. Kikis got on the line and said, you go up, you can consider yourself off this team. Unless you come down immediately, your trip is over. Reluctantly, Dave Rodney agreed to go back down to Camp 2. The following day, Tinker and the team headed back to base camp. But once again, Dave Rodney refused to go. He understood the plan was to take Tinker back down and then head back up, as the weather looked good for the next few days and a summit bid was still possible. Rodney was sharing a tent with Michael, and together they decided to resist Nick Kikas' decision and wait at Camp 2 for the team's return. Why should we go six kilometers back to Camp 1, descend a thousand vertical feet, then descend very, very perilous, 2,000 vertical feet more through the Kumbu Icefall and just come right back up and do it all over again. That didn't make any sense. But one day turned into two, turned into three. It was a number of days. Mike and I were at Camp 2. The others were down below. My feeling is a number of people on the team were a little jealous that we didn't have to take that extra trip back down. At base camp, Tinker's condition hadn't improved. And after a full examination, Dennis Brown advised him that he should return home to England to get hospital treatment. As Mike and I were sitting at Camp 2, we were made aware that John Tinker was going back to England. Nick Kikas was in charge. Over, uh, thinking we might just sit out and wait for you guys to come back up, over. It must have been about day five. Well, bad weather reports coming in, so because we were told there was a five-day weather forecast that was absolutely terrible. No way would there be a summit attempt. So it was no uncertain terms that Mike and I must come down because of this high wind five-day weather forecast. Mike and I, after descending from camp two to base camp, the first thing that we found out about, I believe it was from Dennis, was that we were going straight back up. Not the next day, but the day after that. I was blown away. Had the weather forecast changed like that? At base camp, when Dave Rodney and Michael found out the weather had improved and they were going straight back up for a second summit push, not only were they tired out from the descent, they also felt a change in the atmosphere now that expedition leader John Tinker had returned to England and Nick Kikas was in charge. All I know is that the mood of the camp was that Mike and I were somewhat ostracized. Didn't have any words with Nick Kikas or any of the other guides, the feeling simply was that Michael and I were on the outside. Whilst Michael and Dave Rodney had stayed at Camp 2, the rest of the team had had five days more rest at the lower altitude of base camp. There, they'd been able to regain their lost energy quicker from the first aborted summit bid, a factor which worried Dennis Brown. When we set off from base camp again on our second attempt, Dave Rodney and, and Michael Matthews had only had, uh, I suppose, a day and a half rest at base camp, and that did concern me. Primarily concerned with Michael, because um, he seemed to be slowing down. Um, he wasn't quite his bright, cheery self. He was having more trouble getting up early in the morning. He, he just seemed to be a, a little slower. I think 
that uh, false ascent and the turnaround at uh, Camp 4, coming down and then spending a couple of extra days at Camp 2 had taken a fair amount out of Michael. He'd slowed down quite a lot. I was just hoping that his natural strength would be able to carry him up. As Michael and the team set off on the second summit push, they faced a long couple of days climbing back up to Camp 3. As other team members forged ahead, both Michael and Dave Rodney were a lot slower. By the time they reached camp, they were beginning to feel the strain. I checked my watch here and it tells me it's almost 8 o'clock. Just over 23 and a half thousand feet, we must be at Camp 3. What a day this has been, May the 11th. Boy, did I ever suck wind from ABC to the bottom of the Lotse face. If it wasn't for my good friend, Mike Matthews, with a little pep talk, I don't know if I would have made it, buddy. <laughs> it's true. Hey, shine the light on your face. <laughs> How are you feeling, pal? I'm feeling just fine. Oh, yeah? It's like golf because of the dry air, but... I'm sure Dave's soup will uh, <laughs> make everything all right. All right, anything to add to the viewers at home? Well, just the soup over here. Just how wonderful it, uh, <laughs> it looks. Whoa, it looks like we're ready to eat, buddy. <laughs> Leaving Camp 3, the team made it up to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet. Once again, they were close to the summit and now inside Everest's death zone. From here upwards, the body can no longer adapt to the altitude. They would need to use oxygen. But some of the clients were concerned that the adapted American and British bottles wouldn't work. So I went over to the Sherpa climbing leader, Lac Pagela. I said to him, can I take a bottle of oxygen and make sure it's working? He said, help yourself. So I try one and it's not working. I'm sucking on it. It's like a plastic bag. Nothing coming through. I try another. It's not working. And a third. The same. It would screw in, but no air would come out of it. It would, it would connect, but no air would come out. No oxygen would, would come out. So then I'd go out and get another cylinder, which I thought was... I thought, I'd, I'm doing something wrong here. He finally finds yeah. one. Yeah. And Lak Pagelu gives me a big black felt tip pen. And he says, Dave, could you please put your name on it? Because this bottle worked with my regulator and mask. I start to put my last name on there. And out of the corner of my eye, I see someone approaching me very, very quickly. Something over their head. It's Nick Kikas with an oxygen bottle ready to bop me over my head. I see this. I'm sprinting across the south call of Mount Everest. I turned around and I said, what are you doing? I demand an explanation. There was um, a, a terrible scene outside our tents, actually probably 50 or so meters away. And there was screaming and shouting. Uh, and it was obvious that, um, that Nick Kikas was chasing Dave Rodney. And we just looked out and, and we couldn't believe what was going on. The two of them were shouting and screaming at each other. And then Dave came back to the tent and uh, burst into tears. It, it was very traumatic. He was emotionally devastated, very upset, and, and incredibly angry. <laughs> Kikas claims Rodney's account is pure fabrication and blames Rodney for interfering with his leadership and organization of the oxygen bottles. It was only hours before the team would leave in the pitch black of night for their summit bid. Now was the time that good organization was vital, especially for inexperienced clients like Michael. But after the confrontation, the atmosphere at Camp 4 hit rock bottom. Things began to fall apart. We should all have had a very good, solid talk. This is what will be happening because you're all coming back alive. Some of you may not get to the summit, but you're all coming back alive. And that philosophy was never really communicated to any of us, and especially to someone like Michael, whose ego and whose confidence level said, I'm getting to the top. 
no matter what. When you ask a question of what was the organizational feeling going into our final summit attempt, I can't help but laugh because the word organization doesn't belong in the sentence. Things were thrown together. From the start, it was an accident waiting to happen. I recall talking to Michael. I'm sure I asked him, are you ready, set, go for the summit? And of course, Michael was so confident. And he said, yes, he was ready to go. And he was a little slower, but not to worry. He would, uh, he would be fine. Dear James and Ferg, lots of sun, sex, sand and surf and sangria. Wish you were here. As you can see, the clubs, pubs and chicks are everywhere. Okay, so I finally cracked. On a serious note, Team One, with eight members, have finally fully acclimatised after sleeping at Camp Three. And we are hopefully going to start our summit bid in a few days. Therefore, knock on wood, I shall see you sooner than expected. Give my regards to the rest of the crew. Lots of love, Mike. Mike called us and sort of said to us, you'd be amazed what's going on here. I can't wait to, 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 to tell you everything that's happened. But he didn't actually say anything uh, specific. I remember hearing Mike very exasperated, saying, um, that I wouldn't believe it when he was able to come and sing, you know, when, he was, when he'd be down and recovering and to tell us the stories that he said, you just won't believe what's going on up here. Give me a look, Dennis. Putting the crampons on, buddy. Here we go. All right. Ten midnight, and we're heading off. This is the big one. Let's hope the weather's good for us. Great. Just before midnight on the 12th of May, 1999, Michael and the rest of the team set off for the summit of Everest. They'd scoured Camp 4 to find as many oxygen bottles as they could that seemed to work. And although unsure of the organization, they headed into the night. I think it was either going to be the 12th or the 13th that they summited. And when the 14th, we hadn't heard anything. I started saying to David, you know, why, why haven't we heard anything? It was possibly the next day that we got a call from John Tinker, first thing in the morning, who said that Mike had been lost on the mountain for 20 hours. Michael and OTT summit day had gone badly wrong. From the start, the weather conditions looked good. The wind was quite high, but the sky was clear. After climbing through the night, the first clients reached the summit just after 9 a.m. I thought, this is fantastic. I'm getting my chance, despite all of the problems with OTT, whether they be oxygen or logistics or communications or sweeping or whatever, I'm actually getting my chance. And I got to the top, and the first thing that I did was I sat down in the snow and just enjoyed the moment. The most emotional moment was not arriving on the summit, but it was just before the summit. It was the moment I thought, there is the summit, I'm going to make it, and I can't climb any higher on the world. I was taking two or three steps at a time, collapsing on my ice axe, and then dragging myself up another two or three steps just to collapse again. For some reason, Michael had slowed even more than his teammates on summit day and had fallen way behind. As the team were beginning their slow descent back down to Camp 4, they passed Michael on his way up. Some distance behind him was guide Mike Smith. Head Sherpa Lakpa Gelu felt that Michael was too far behind and moving too slowly to make the summit safely. The wind was growing stronger and the weather could change. He told Michael to turn around and go back down. Lakpagelu had been coming down from the summit, had just come down the Hillary step and Michael was going up 
and because of the wind he yelled at him he said he had to yell because of the wind um, and he yelled at him you must turn around turn around now but guide Mike Smith didn't know a Sherpa had told Michael to turn around and said he would accompany him to the summit there was still time by now Michael was less than 400 feet away and he said he wanted to go in one sense, Michael is being told to turn around by a Sherpa, but a guide is saying, no, I'll come with you to the summit. I mean, it seems very obvious that Michael would, would leap at that opportunity to go up to the summit with a guide. I, I mean, gee, it sounds pretty safe and secure. But within the next couple of hours, the weather began to change severely, and the wind grew a lot stronger. I knew just looking at the weather, feeling the wind, that the conditions were changing. I could see the telltale wind hitting the top, the, the summit ridge, and, and I knew once you get caught in that wind, you're in a lot of trouble. Well, we had a very traumatic descent back down to Camp 4. Very high winds, deep snow, we could hardly see, there was spindrift blowing around, it was very cold. I'm sure the wind was well over 100 miles an hour and it was 40 below. I kept looking over my shoulder, hoping and praying that Mike and Mike were coming back safely, very quickly. But every single time I looked up to the south summit, I didn't see any of them. And as I've said, this uh, childhood dream was quickly turning into a nightmare. I thought, oh no. Michael and guide Mike Smith reached the summit at midday, when the weather still seemed fine. Michael, though exhausted, had made it to the top, the youngest ever Briton to summit Everest. Mike Smith took photographs of Michael, checked his oxygen was working, and they began their descent. But Michael began to slow drastically. The wind grew stronger, and the storm blew in. Before long, Michael and Mike were caught in winds of over 100 miles per hour and in whiteout conditions. It wasn't until dusk that Mike Smith staggered into Camp 4, where the rest of the team were desperately trying to shelter from the storm. But Michael Matthews wasn't with him. I think it was two hours after I arrived in Camp 4 that uh, Mike Smith arrived in the tent. So I was the first person, I think, to know and to hear that Michael was missing and he came back alone. It was a terrible moment, but he, he said it as a fact, but also a little bit hopeless. I can remember only that I was asking Mike things and that I was thinking a little bit, but it can't be possible that a guide is leaving the client. The storm raged all night long at Camp 4, and the team struggled to fight off the freezing temperatures. By the next morning, it had grown worse, and the clients were exhausted. Nick Kikus and Mike Smith decided the team should head back down the mountain. Any search for Michael now would only risk more lives. The weather was so bad, we were trying to almost stay alive in a sense, but far worse than that was the inner turmoil that was going on, just knowing that we had turned our back on Michael in a sense, we'd left him up there, and there was very little likelihood that he would have survived. I desperately wanted to run up that mountain and and carry him down and my teammates quickly convinced me that it was already too late that there's no way that he could have survived the night by now the ott team had fallen apart the clients wanted answers they'd been told that michael had slowed dramatically fighting the storm Mike Smith had gone ahead of Michael to cut a path through the snow and pull out the rope they were following. But the clients wanted to know more. How had Mike Smith lost contact with Michael? A meeting between the guides and the clients was called on the last night before they left for home. Even though he was expedition leader, Nick Kikus wasn't there. 
Sir Mike Smith was left to answer the questions alone. Mike Smith's report was that somewhere below the cell summit and before the balcony, he looked back and couldn't see Mike. He waited for some time. He tried to get radio contact, he said. That didn't work. He tried to go up, but because of the wind, 100 miles an hour, minus 40, the amount of snow that had fallen, it, it, he said that it was like a treadmill and he couldn't get anywhere. He waited some more. He made another radio call for help. His toes were getting very, very cold. And he decided that it was best that he went down without Mike. I just don't understand how a guy puts himself in that position where he gets so far ahead that he looks back and he can't see his client. He can't get up to him. He can't get help from down below. So he leaves. That's not good enough. After Mike Smith's explanation, the mood of the meeting changed. More of the 13 clients began complaining about the oxygen they'd been given on summit day. The first to talk about having trouble with oxygen was Augusto Ortega. He said that his cylinder was cutting in and cutting out whilst he was climbing, and he was upset about the oxygen that he was supplied with. And then Constantine Diarchus came in, and he too had had oxygen problems. And it just went on from there. Everybody was complaining about the oxygen they were given. It wasn't right. It was just cutting in and cutting out. So then Mike Smith, he apologized. He said, I'm, I'm sorry about this. He said, it appears that Henry Todd, this guy called Henry Todd, he supplied the oxygen cylinders. And he was sorry that they didn't work. And that was it. He was just sorry. It was just bizarre. He then turned around and, and said to us all, looking at me especially because he knew I'd fallen out of OTT the way I'd, we'd, I'd been treated. And he said, uh, let's not mention this problem of oxygen to the Matthews family, because it will only upset them. We would overdo the phone call, and it was weighing greatly on his mother's mind. And then the phone went because John Tinker and I greeted him quite cheerfully because I felt he was going to ring and say that all was well and Mike was down and they'd done it. And in fact, he said that it was difficult news. Uh, everybody was down bar Mike. Uh, Mike was up there. Um, there'd been some sort of accident. Information was sketchy. Um, I replied by asking if there was anybody with Mike, and there wasn't. And, uh, and uh, the weather was very bad. So you know, there was that you know, realization that, that it couldn't be worse. Well, straight away, I, I, I knew that he was dead. And uh, I felt John had waited and rang when he thought that there was no more hope. What happened in the next day or two after Michael's disappearance was that we talked a lot to John Tinker. He said he'd had a word and he wrote to us about this. He'd, he'd checked into things and he was pleased to be able to tell us OTT had been fine on the hill on the day. There was no, no problems, etc., etc. To try to find out more about Michael's death, the family then met with John Tinker, Nick Kikus and Mike Smith. Again, they were assured that the team had operated well on Everest. The danger of the mountain had killed Michael. Things changed. We started to, our family, to try to adjust as families do to the loss of a, of a, of a, of a much-loved member. It was very early one morning. Uh, telephone went and uh, this voice came on and you don't know me my name's John Krellin uh, but I was on the climb with Michael I've reason to believe that you've been told a load of rubbish about the circumstances and I just wonder if you know that there were major problems with oxygen on that expedition 
David was upset, but he, he composed himself well. He said, I knew there was something wrong out there. He said, when I had my meeting with um, OTT, there was just something in the air. I just knew, I knew in my bones as an old dealer that you know, I knew that I knew it was fishy. I knew there were things that I wasn't happy about. I started to ring round and I spent days doing this. I contacted pretty well everybody who'd been on the climb. I mean, I got Dave Rodney and Dennis Brown and so on, straight people. The incredible thing about it was that all of the client climbers on the um, OTT 1999 Everest summit bid in May said one thing, and, and it was completely the opposite of what the OTT John Tinker, Nick Kikas, Mike Smith story was on the other. Just the opposite. It's been two years since Michael's death. OTT, now called Alpine Mountaineering, maintain their team of guides operated professionally on the mountain. They say the storm killed Michael. An inquiry by the British Association of Mountain Guides found their guides had acted according to professional standards. But the family's and clients' concerns about the oxygen and team organization still remain. In Michael's memory, the Sherpas built a memorial close to base camp. The questions that our family would like answering about Michael's death is uh, whether or not he was provided with proper oxygen, whether or not he was deserted descending from the summit of Mount Everest by his professional guide, and whether or not the stories of shocking mismanagement and ill-tempered behavior on the hill are true or whether they're not. It was too soon for Mike to die. He was only just 22. It doesn't seem fair that he was taken, taken from, from us. I think what happened to, to Mike would always be a mystery in part. But it's one of the reasons I think you can't guide up there. In those circumstances, at that height in the world, it's by and large every man for himself. What's really crucial is why Michael wasn't better looked after. That's really the bottom line. He was slow, maybe his oxygen was malfunctioning. Why didn't, why weren't the watchdogs put onto him? Watch Michael like a hawk. It should have been the best day of my life. And Mike's. Um, in pretty much every way it was the absolute worst. Was it worth the summit? Was it worth the trip? Absolutely not. Would I trade the summit for a safe return with Mike? Absolutely. But I can't. Next Wednesday at 9, an intimate insight into Mick Jagger's personal life in Being Mick. Check it out in a moment. Next on 4, Antoine gives us access to Eurotrash. <laughs>